The year is 1991, and we are smack dab in the middle of a recession that, against all previous assumptions, impacts the film industry and possibly kicks off a set of changes that affects how films are still made today. Welcome to A Year in Film History, a series where we go year by year and take a look at all the interesting, controversial, and sometimes wacky things that happened in the film industry. And in this video, we're setting our sights on the year where Terminator 2 broke technological barriers, the sounds of the lamps got greedy at the Oscars, and some major scandals made headlines. 1991. We're starting off the movie section strong, with a film that many consider to be the single greatest action movie of all time, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. At the time, it was the most expensive movie ever made, taking the title of first movie that cost $100 million to produce. And it was mostly due to its very advanced visual effects, which we'll go over in more detail later in this video. This film ended up being a massive success, landing the top spot on the list of highest grossing films at the box office for 1991, after bringing in $520.8 million worldwide. T2 flipped everything that happened in the original Terminator on its head. We saw the T-800, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, become the film's protagonist, which was actually spoiled in the trailers leading up to the release. We saw Sarah Connor go from an innocent young female lead to a badass with some top-notch survival skills, and a villain that was even worse and more fear and Producing than the one in the original. T2 even changed genres from the original. Where the first one was more of a horror slasher film, this one was a traditional action film. It's one of the rare occurrences of a sequel outshining the original. We all know that sequels are meant to go bigger. But we often see bigger meaning larger explosions and more characters, without much thought being put into how those play into the larger theme. Terminator 2 raised the stakes and provided audiences with a white knuckling action film that not only pushed its story, its characters, and its scenes to the next level, but also pushed boundaries on what was possible with technology all while being very meticulous in its approach. This film added a lot to the Terminator universe, setting up sequels and spin-offs for years to come, although none would live up to it. It would go on to get nominated for six Oscars, taking four of them home. The next film we wanted to focus on is considered to be a sleeper hit that took a while to get its wheels spinning. A movie that is regularly cited by critics, directors, and audiences as one of the greatest and most influential films of all time, The Silence of the Lambs. The Silence of the Lambs changed what we thought of when horror films and serial killers came to mind. Before this, we often considered serial killers to be these over-the-top, scary-looking characters that would appear out of nowhere to surprise and scare their prey. Hannibal Lecter was terrifying, but in a completely different way. He was intelligent, had good manners, was a normal-looking guy who loved his fava beans and a nice Chianti, yet he carried a terrifying presence with him. This film is often said to have elevated mainstream horror and proved that the genre could have some prestige and maturity to it. This movie is often considered to have highlighted her fascination with serial killers and kickstarted a decade of media that was devoted to criminal profiling. These days, this type of serial killer and film isn't anything new to us. We might have even become desensitized to this type of entertainment since after the film's 2017 re-release in the UK, the British Board of Film Classification reclassified it from an 18 to a 15 certificate. The BBFC's Craig Lapper went on to say that audiences have become used to this type of crime drama. But beyond having a huge influence on the film industry and more specifically the crime and horror genres, The Silence of the Lamb absolutely killed it with critics and audiences alike. It was the fifth highest grossing film of the year, bringing in a total of $272 million at the box office on a budget of only $19 million, and was the third film to win the top five category Oscars, the previous two being 1934's It Happened One Night and 1975's One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. On top of that, it was the first and still the only Best Picture winner that is widely considered a horror film. It was also the first movie to be released on home video prior to winning the Best Picture award. This was due to its February release date, which was pretty early considered most Oscar winners come out later in the year as to stay fresh in critics' minds. I think it's safe to assume that all these awards helped a lot with home sales. Jodie Foster won her second Best Actress award for her work in The Silence of the Lambs. 28 years old at the time, she was and still is the youngest person to ever win two Oscars. Let's move on to Beauty and the Beast. Based on the original fairy tale and also Jean Cocteau's 1946 live action version of the story, Beauty and the Beast is still considered to be one of the most prestigious and best animated romantic films in cinema history. It continued the Disney Renaissance era and was the first ever fully animated movie to be nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. Yes, we know 1964's Mary Poppins was also nominated, but it was only partially animated. No animated film has ever went on to win the prestigious award, but it showed the film 
film industry and audiences alike that animated films can be a serious form of film and storytelling. The movie wasn't only great because of its story, characters, and visuals. It also pushed boundaries with CGI, which we'll talk more about in the technology section later in this video. When it released, it was adored by both critics and audiences and made it to the number three spot for highest grossing film of that year bringing in about 346 million at the box office. It went on to be nominated for six Academy Awards, taking home two for Best Original Score and Best Original Song, which isn't all that surprising since the general consensus is that the film had very catchy and memorable music. So good, in fact, that it also won five of the eight Grammys it was nominated for. Now on to another movie, Boys in the Hood. Ice Cube's debut as an actor in a narrative film, which actually garnered him some nominations across the various award ceremonies. It even got him a win as most promising actor at the Chicago Film Critics Association Awards. This film was significant because it was the first mainstream movie to deal with gang violence in America's urban ghettos. And because of this, there was a lot of controversy that followed the film a lot of it unwarranted. Many suggested that Boys in the Hood was marketed as a gang film. But the director, John Singleton, refuted those claims and even went on to say that the advertising campaign was based in reality. The film's opening was overshadowed by violence in 12 states, leaving three dead and many wounded, with many theaters even pulling the film. But despite all the controversies, it received tons of critical appraise, and even a Best Director nomination for John Singleton. This was the first time that an African American was nominated for Best Director at the Academy Awards. 24 years and 44 days old at the time, John Singleton was, and still is, the youngest Best director nominee ever. 1991 also saw the release of the Taiwanese epic teen crime drama, A Brighter Summer Day. Directed by Edward Yang, this movie is associated with the new Taiwanese cinema. During the 80s, the Taiwanese film industry was facing some difficulties and wanted to push for more homegrown directors and films. Because of this, an initiative was started to support several up-and-coming young directors. This movie is part of the wave of films from Taiwan that took a new approach to their overall tone. Instead of melodrama or kung fu action films, these new films were known for their realistic, down-to-earth, and sympathetic portrayal of Taiwanese life. A Brighter Summer Day sits at a 100% Rotten Tomato score and an overall audience score of 94%. And as of writing this video, it's the 19th highest rated film on Letterboxd. It is often considered to be one of the most acclaimed films of all time and helped propel the Taiwanese film industry to new places. Without going into too much detail about each one, here are some other notable films that came out this year. The historical epic, Daughters of Dust. This was the first independent film produced, written, and directed by an African-American woman that won a general theatrical release. In 2004, it became the first film made by an African-American woman to be added to the National Film Registry at the Library of Congress. Ridley Scott's Thelma and Louise, the first female buddy slash road film starring two female heroines. There was some controversy surrounding it with how feminist it actually was, but in 2011, Raina Lipsitz called it the last great film about women and said that it was one of the reasons 1992 became the year of the woman. Martin Scorsese's Cape Fear also came out this year in which Robert De Niro went to the dentist to purposefully ruin his own teeth for the role. Talk about dedication. Gus Van Sant's My Own Private Idaho, Catherine Bigelow's Point Break, and Peter Hewitt's Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey all came out this year starring Keanu Reeves. Talk about a busy year for the world's nicest man. In this section, we go over the 1992 Oscars for movies that came out in 1991. Billy Crystal is hosting again for the third straight year, but unlike the previous year's Oscars, this one was received positively overall. Crystal was wheeled out on stage in a full-blown Hannibal Lecter costume to parody The Silence of the Lambs. Diane Ladd and Laura Dern were nominated for Best Supporting Actress and Best Actress respectively. They were the first mother and daughter nominated in the same year. There were many great nominees and winners, including the ones already mentioned, although Silence of the Lamb was the clear winner that night. But the Oscars didn't go without their fair share of controversy. LGBT LGBTQ plus activists such as Queer Nation and Out in Film plan to protest the Academy Awards because of the offensive and unflattering portrayals of homosexual in films such as Silence of the Lambs, JFK, and the upcoming Basic Instinct. The Silence of the Lambs was touted as being transphobic and criticized for his depiction of Buffalo Bill, but the director went on to say that people were misinterpreting the character. There was indeed an Oscar night protest that resulted in the arrest of 10 people. 
We can't talk about 1991 without discussing the 1991 box office collapse. This is a huge topic that we'll probably make an entire video about, but the general idea is that in 1991, the box office struggled. It saw an 11% drop in returns when compared to the previous year's numbers. Admissions in August and September were the worst since 1978, and unlike in previous decades where a famous face could basically buy you a hit movie independent of how good the film was, that mindset was starting to crumble. The film industry was still doing things the same way it used to, but the the general audience was starting to smarten up. This was just one of the reasons that people point to when discussing the low box office numbers. We were also smack dab in the middle of a recession which meant people were tightening their belts and spending less on unnecessary things. In the past, movies were considered to be recession proof because they were a cheap form of entertainment and escapism for people dealing with financial woes. But that was no longer the case. Going to the movies was now more expensive which resulted in people turning away from them when times were tough. Jeffrey Katzenberg, the head of Disney at the time, wrote up what is now known as the Katzenberg Memo that described some major worries and fears for the future of the film industry. We won't go into detail about this in this video, but the three main points were that one, Hollywood had a blockbuster mentality where instead of making a bunch of cheaper movies, they were really betting on the success of a handful of very expensive ones. Two, the film industry isn't recession proof. And three, the rise and fall of the movie star. We've discussed this topic at length in some of our other videos, but the general idea is that intellectual property is now more important than the movie star, and that movies have to be good for people to actually want to see them versus just wanting to see them because of a name. These thoughts cause the shift in the film industry that continues to this day. As weird as it sounds, there is something nostalgia inducing about the movie star driven culture of old. But the main takeaway from this section is that in 1991, the film industry struggled. We embarrassingly forgot to talk about Terminator 2 in our video about what makes 90s movies feel like 90s movies. So here we go. Terminator 2 was expensive to make, but it was because of the barriers it broke and how it propelled the visual effects industry forward. This film had the first truly believable, naturally moving, computer generated character in a film known as the T-1000. It was Hollywood's first instance of a CGI main character. And man, when working on this video, I watched T2 again and tried to put myself into the mindset of someone in 1991. But I couldn't stop thinking about how this film still holds up today. I can't even imagine the sheer number of blown minds when it first came out. Sure, it's showing its age here and there, but I was so immersed that I have no complaints about the CGI. The way it was used was perfect. This movie had over 300 special effects shots that made up 16 minutes of its total runtime. It went on to win the Oscar for Best Visual Effects, which was the first ever visual effects Oscar, and it was very well deserved. Not many directors out there have pushed the film industry forward as much as James Cameron has throughout his career, and he's still continuing to do so. Beauty and the Beast also broke ground with its early use of CGI. It combined 2D and 3D animation techniques to provide a better sense of depth during some of its scenes. The most notable being the ballroom dance scene, where with the aid of the Pixar developed caps, animators were able to combine hand-drawn characters with sweeping camera movements. This required the use of existing modeling and rendering software to create the CG background, allowing it to move with the camera. The film's success and innovative methods paved the way for Disney to experiment more with digital animation techniques, which included the creation of the deep canvas process for 1999's Tarzan. This process allowed 2D artists to make 3D paintings and move a camera freely through them. Unlike last year's video, this one has two pretty large controversies that we just had to mention. First up, Tailhook 91. This was a military scandal involving the essay of up to 83 women and 7 men that took place at the 35th Annual Tailhook Association Symposium in 1991. Okay, okay, but what does this have to do with the film industry? A lot actually. Many of the perpetrators were accused of having a top gun mentality and the film was blamed for basically causing a shift in mindset in the Navy. Top gun is cool, there's no denying that. And because of this, it boosted recruiting numbers to the military, but the new recruits that were coming in had the wrong mindset and expectations. The movie basically gave the impression that the behaviors of the on-screen personas were totally fine in the real world, which contributed to why the scandal happened in the first place. We have an entire video about this that goes into more detail if you want to check it out. Link is in the description. Another major controversy this year had to do with the actor who played Pee Wee Herman, Paul Rubens. He was arrested in July of 1991 for public indecency in an adult theater. For an actor who played a lovable kid's character who, I won't lie, creeps the heck out of me, this isn't a good look. It was a scandal that was widely covered on the news. It even resulted in Toys R Us removing Pee Wee toys from its stores. Rubens did not offer interviews or appear on talk shows, and even though he received a lot of public backlash, he was supported by many of his fellow artists. He did bounce back though and remain controversy free. 
until 2002 with another arrest we won't go into detail about. 1991 also saw a pretty big film distributor go bankrupt, Orion Pictures. They were the distributors for four Best Picture winners, including 1984's Amadeus, 1986's Platoon, 1990's Dances with Wolves, and 1991's The Silence of the Lambs. They went bankrupt before the 1992 Academy Awards ceremony, which saw The Silence of the Lambs scoop up the five major awards. But how did a distributor associated with such highly acclaimed and successful films go bankrupt? Well, they had a very shaky financial situation that was a result of years of making films that lost money. In July 1997, they were acquired by NGM, but it was a shell of its former self. Starting in 2013, Orion had somewhat of a revival as they returned to television production, and on August 20th, 2020, they even announced that they would be relaunched again and would shift focus to films made by underrepresented filmmakers. Okay. Moving on, in 1991, the American serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was caught. The story was intensively covered by mass media, and I actually find it quite ironic since the top film of the year was also about a serial killer cannibal. Since then, there have been many books, films, and shows created about him. Even Netflix went on to create the very popular Dahmer, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. And finally, 1991 also saw the birth of Sony Pictures Entertainment. The tech giant Sony bought Columbia Pictures on September 28, 1989. But it wasn't until 1991 when Sony Pictures Entertainment was officially formed. Because of this, there was a lot of renaming within the subsidiaries that were now owned by Sony. Unlike in our previous video of this series, 1991 didn't have that many major names that were born that year. At first, I thought it was because it's not that long ago until I realized it's 32 years ago. So then it got me thinking, it might have something to do with the shift in Hollywood's mindset away from its star-driven culture. But here are a few names that stood out. Austin Butler, Lakeith Stanfield, Emma Roberts, Zazie Beetz, and Shailene Woodley among the many more shown on screen. We won't go over all of the deaths that happened this year, but we wanted to pay respect to a few that you can see on screen now. We'll include a link to a longer list in the description. 1991 doesn't have as many interesting things on the topic of television as our previous video, but here are a few that we found. What we know as Comedy Central Today launched on April Fool's Day 1991 as CTV The Comedy Network. They definitely chose a fitting day for it. A few months later on June 1st, they officially changed their name to Comedy Central. The top rated show of 1991 was CBS's 60 Minutes followed by ABC's Roseanne. We also saw the creation of many shows this year. Not as game changing as the ones we discussed in our last video, but they're still notable. We have Home Improvement, Rugrats, The Ren and Stimpy Show, and The Red Green Show among many more shown on screen. That's about it for the television section. Thanks for watching. 1991 can be considered the start of the shift that we saw in Hollywood that is still felt today. It was a very interesting year, especially for the film industry. Let us know if there are any interesting things we miss in the comments below. If you like these kind of videos, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, have a good one.